rub a dub dub you can watch this video in the tub so welcome to lipids part three while we demulsify emulsifiers and this is also the week we usually make our own soap in lab and so we're going to first talk about soap and emulsifying and so i'm going to start out by teaching you how to draw. So you can pause me and get ready to do some saponification. The trick with saponification is first you hydrolyze. So first hydrolyze. So cut it. So just like what we did, but there's a second step. Is you're gonna do an acid-base reaction. Elephant could not handle so you guys. Oh no, not acid base. So the acids are the fatty acids. That's why they're called fatty acids. And what an acid is, is an acid donates hydrogen. So hydrolyze, do your OHs and your hose. Your glycerol stays how it was. That does not change. Make your fatty acid and then go back and erase your hydrogen. Just the hydrogen on the fatty acid, not on the glycerol. Got it? All right. And the base is going to be NaOH. Sometimes it's KOH. You can go back through your homework and make it NaOH. Um, but you can also use KOH. So when they used to use seaweed uh, to make soap, these, it was KOH and originally the pot ashes. So that H becomes a sodium ion. The H came off and combined with the OH. So all those H's came off and became part of the OH, which is back to water. Um, so we don't typically show the water. That oxygen, when you pull that H off, that oxygen is missing. It's hydrogen. So it actually has a negative charge. So I like to show the negative charge because that makes it special, and then that attracts the sodium, which is a sodium ion. And this part, these are soap molecules. Actually, they're not molecules, but these are soap. And that is tonification. But we're gonna do one more piece with the soap. Is if you take your soap molecule, the kink don't matter at all with soap. The part that matters is this. This is the ionic head. And actually, let's erase all these other things. They don't matter anymore. All that matters is our soap. So the glycerol is gone. It is ionic. We call it the head. And this part here is called the hydrocarbon tail, or just the carbon tail. And why this is special from what we have done so far this week to, hydrocarbons are nonpolar. Where this is polar bear, so it's not polar. It's like the elephant. Ionic love water. And so ionic is hydrophilic. Water loves ions. Ions love water. This is love. Nonpolar is a term chemists use, uh, and I'm teaching about polar, nonpolar right now in my other class, so the video I just made half hour ago was all about that. Instead of saying nonpolar when you have hydrogen and carbons only, the term we're going to be using this term is hydrophobic. You may hear me say polar, nonpolar, but hydrophobic means Phobic means fear. In this case, it's afraid of the water. Now, they don't actually have fear. These are true, um, it's repelled. It has no interest in water. Water has no interest in that. Water, we draw it like this, OHs. It's looking for things that have a pull. And carbons and hydrogens are nonpolar. That's the key. If something is only carbons and hydrogens, and that is the point of lipids. Lipids do not like water. 
And so when you have grease, when you have oil, so if you were eating bacon, you get the big wad of greasy stuff, and it doesn't mix with the water. You can't clean it with water. You have to use soap. Um, soap is amazing. And so what happens? You're going to get at some point on quiz in that lab when we eventually do it. So you can do grease, dirt, oil, viruses. That the hydrocarbon tail is attracted to the grease, the oil. This part is nonpolar. So things that are not polar are attracted to each other. It's like my um, squid. Oh, wait, my elephant. My squid should not be part of each other. All right, there we go. These guys are nonpolar. They're going over there. So the zigzag just represents carbon. This would be a three-dimensional boat that we make. So the hydrocarbon tails are towards the middle, towards the grease and oil, nonpolar towards nonpolar, and the ionic head is on the outside, which is the water. And so what soap does is soap makes a micelle. Those of you who've had anatomy, you probably learned about micelles, but it is a boat that will carry away. All right, so I cut myself off there. I don't know why, but let's go ahead over the science that I just talked about. So let's talk about the science. So what soap is, is it's a salt. So that's what I was trying to explain. Uh, not like table salt. So when a chemist says salt, we just mean anything that's ionic. And that's what I was showing in that little video clip. So we make soap when we do an acid-base reaction. Uh, and the acid and base neutralize one another and they make water, we just, I didn't show the water, and a salt, an ionic compound. And what I was emphasizing there, ionic compounds and water, they are absolute love. This is pure love. It's where they make these cartoons. So ions would love water. So this is water, the H2O, and this is something that's hydrophobic. So lipids are normally hydrophobic. And so what soap does is it bridges these two parts. And the very intro slide said that we're talking about emulsifiers today, and that's what an emulsifier does, is it can do both. Uh, it's a bridge between hydrophilic and hydrophobic, and that's what soap does. Uh, and so normally we think of our fatty acid like this, that this picture shows you. We pulled off the hydrogen there, uh, and that would be something like NaOH and that leaves you with a negative charge, making it ionic. And this ionic part now at the top is the head and loves the water, and this hydrocarbon tail does not like the water, but they're stuck together, which will make them an emulsifier. So the acids are the fatty acids. This is a triglyceride. These are saturated fats. You should recognize that because they zigzag, there's no kinks. Uh, and there's the glycerol, shown nicely in red. And so the acids come from the triglycerides, fats and oils, when you make soap. Uh, the type of fatty acid, whether it's saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, trans fat, determines different characteristics of the soap. Uh, and so here's our saturated, here's showing all the kinks. Uh, and so this would be one kink, so that's a MUFA, so both of these are. Um, because they make that just like an angle. Uh, this one has two kinks, so it makes the L shape. We get the candy cane when we do three, and then this guy ends up almost looping all the way around, because he has actually four kinks in him. All right, but depending on what type of fatty acid was in our triglyceride determines how hard the soap is, how fluffy it is, the latherability, the conditioning, the cleansing. So you can do things like this, depending on your soap. So if we were making soap, we'll pretend like we are, or you can make soap, you can use coconut oil. It's a good way to use the coconut oils because you should not be eating it. So in lab, we usually use coconut oil. Uh, we also use olive oil. So for those of you, you should all be giving up your oils for consumption. This would be a great way is to make soap and use up all those oils in your house you don't want to use for consumption. So Crisco 
was amazing for making pies. It was one of the last things that they started removing the trans fats from. Um, and it also messed up our soap when they got rid of the trans fats because the trans fats made our soap harder because they stacked. And when they changed the recipe of Crisco, our soap became really soft. Um, and so we had to change our recipe. Um, we don't use bacon grease. Um, yeah. All right, the base. Well, originally, I said this wrong in the video, but originally they used pot ashes. So potash, potassium, comes from the word that it was pot ashes. Uh, so the wood ashes and um, sodium. So sodium hydroxide was actually from the seaweed. So it meant soda ash. Uh, and these soaps were very harsh and mushy and they were actually quite unpleasant. And it's probably why people didn't take many baths. And we can see that dog was like not very happy. And then the 1700s, Nicholas LeBlanc discovered how to make lye economically. And so then your puppies were very happy. Grandma could make lye soap and you can actually buy it in the store. So if you do want to make soap, um, you can also find it online and it has to be 100%, and that's why there's warnings. If you do try to make it yourself, uh, it ends up being wonderful. Um, you do have to wear gloves the whole time because that is straight NaOH and it will burn. And then you can't get any sun exposure on any skin that got a chemical burn because then you cause actual damage. Um, and so it's like a three month time that you have to wear a sock over your hand if you didn't wear gloves. Um, I had worked with a guy and that happened and he had to wear a sock the whole summer over his arm. It wasn't from the sodium hydroxide, it was another one. All right, so saponification is first we hydrolyze and then we do the, acid, the reaction between the acid and base. So there's our triglyceride, we add the NaOH, we cut it into two and this is what I was showing. So this is our hydrophilic part, the ions, and this is our carbon hydrocarbon tail is going to be hydrophobic um, and so we usually show it with a circle and then squigglies so hydrophilic hydrophobic uh, and the soap heads hydrophilic so if you love water and the carbon tail is hydrophobic if you're going to be afraid of the water all right this is a question on the test i'm always amazed people you you want to get this one right all right, Philadelphia was the city of brotherly love, um, and so philic means love. Uh, grease, fat, dirt, oil are hydrophobic, and so the hydrophobic tail, so there's our hydrophobic tail, is going to be attracted to grease and grime and oil, and as it turns out, virus coats. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment. And then the hydrophilic head, well, that's attracted to water, and if you have a cat, they probably can do weird things like that. So the word is emulsify. Uh, so the ads get it wrong. A lot of stuff is wrong on Google, just be forewarned. Um, it doesn't actually dissolve the grease. It emulsifies. It makes these little boats around the grease, the oil, uh, and so this is the hydrocarbon tail. They're not showing the squigglies nicely. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes students make when they draw these micelles is they like drawing two squiggles. Soap molecules are only gonna have one squiggle. So they're just one fatty acid and then the circle just represents uh, the ionic head. So the soap forms a boat. So if I was at the board, I would actually draw my little sailboat and it would carry it away. Emulsify is why we have chocolate. So chocolate is made up of sugar and fat. Sugar is very hydrophilic. Fat is very hydrophobic. The only way they could figure out, this was Mr. Hershey, added an emulsifier. Uh, and we'll get to that in later on. It was less of them. Uh, and so salad dressings are now mostly where they were for a long time, like ranch dressing has the emulsifier, so you'll see lecithin in there. Uh, they don't add soap, obviously. They use other ones that we'll get to. After, so after a perfectly balanced saponification process, the soap no longer has the lye or the fatty acids. 
They're both uh, quote unquote consumed during this process. Uh, the best soap makers then will add other trace things like scents and um, that actually is something that's called super fatting and makes the soap extra luxurious. So it makes it more moisturizing, more nourishing. And so the soap that we make, well, our soap is amazing. So most of the commercial soap that many of you are using is not actually true soap. It's actually an evil blend of chemical detergents, artificial lathering agents, and toxic chemicals. I know, right? Um, so glycerin, which is a natural moisturizer and would still be in our soap because we don't take it out, well, they actually remove it and then sell it separate so they can make extra money. Uh, and they, they remove it and then replace it with artificial detergents and chemicals. And it dries out your skin. Um, our soap retains the glycerin. Another thing is they looked at commercial bar soap and they found over 20 toxic ingredients were added many of which have been connected to cancer, endocrine issues, skin problems, and more. I know, another EGAD. Right, that cat. So, just keep calm and make soap. I never saw the movie, but the book is amazing. So you should read the book Bite Club. But not right now, because you should be studying for chemistry. All right, the term soap uh, actually comes from the Romans. So we're gonna look at a little bit of history. In 1000 BC, women did laundry in a river next to Sappo Hill is the story. So there's the woman doing their laundry. And they noticed there was this sudsy ooze leaching out of the clay soil on the here, hill. And that sudsy ooze that they did their laundry over by there, it actually made their clothes cleaner. And later what they found out, this was the sudsy ooze was rendered animal fat, dripping through the ashes in the cooking pit uphill. Uh, had soaked through the earth and was coming down into the river. In case you don't know what rendered animal fat drippings look like, there you go. So next time you make your animal food, you can just put it and allow all the fat to drip through. Uh, and yeah, it's beautiful. That's picture Joey and me in Nepal doing our own laundry. So that's I think the only time I've had to do it by hand. My grandma used to have a machine that you had to turn the handle um, and that's how it went through before these amazing machines we all use now. So what else did the Romans use? Well, initially soap was made by mixing the rendered animal fat with the pot ashes and it's what we call potassium carbonate today. But by about 100 AD, the Romans, oh, multiple choice, here we go. Were they using mushrooms? and snail slime. Oh, that was the thing where they crawl on your face, the hyaluronic acid, and make your lips plumper. Or were they using urine and sheep wool grease, which is lanolin? Were they using donkey dew and rotten apples? Or, oh, was it the land of milk and honey and bee venom? Well, you probably already know the answer. And if you didn't, the key was the word grease there because that's where the fatty acids come from. The Dunky Doo picture was inspired because again, when Joey and I were in Nepal, uh, we passed so many donkeys and it turned out that Dunky Doo is the secret behind Nepal's freaking amazing apples. Best apples I've ever had in my life. The bee venom is what they like put into people's lips to make them plumper and the snails slime on your skin to make your skin look younger. So they were called fool ones. And these were people who roamed the streets of ancient Rome and collected ammonium carbonate, AKA urine. I find it interesting the name was fool ones. So they were full of urine and they really had to pee. Um, so yeah, this they then sold to soap makers. So if you lost a job because of what has recently happened with the coronavirus, you guys could go around. You could become a full one and go around door to door. Or maybe you should study so you don't have to become one of those. All right. And yeah, you can even study in your bathtub. This is apparently some famous writer. I had never heard of him, but I thought the picture was funny. And I, there was supposed to be a video clip there. Let's see what happened to my video clip. I apologize. So 
the video clip, um, I'm pretty sure, let's see if it comes up on the next slide. Maybe that was just my mistake. Uh, so when in Rome, the Romans also rubbed their bodies with olive oil and sand, and then they used this thing, which I think I have another picture. Uh, they used something called a sturgeon, which, there we go, that is a picture of a sturgeon relic. Uh, and they actually scraped the dead skin off. Rather than taking a bath, they covered themselves in olive oil and sand and then scraped the dead skin off. Uh, and then there is the public bathing that was all throughout Greece and uh, the Roman Empire. And yeah, the decline of the Roman Empire, however, also saw, saw a decline in soap making, except in the Arab world, which is interesting. So during the plague outbreaks in the Middle Ages, public baths were closed like currently all of our swimming pools are closed, right? Bathing became unfashionable and sinful. Actually, right now, that's not true. The average person took one bath per year, one bath per year, because they thought bathing was what was causing the plague. Can you imagine? Yeah, the dogs were probably not happy by the smell that was, or maybe they were very happy. The soap that they used was used for laundry and dishes. But with our advances in science and medicine, we now know that disease and cleanliness are related and the World Health Organization says the single most effective and economical method to fight disease around the world is indeed a bar of soap. Uh, and yeah, there are places where you can make these simple donations. Um, here we go. So we're going to watch this video and it's only like three minutes long, but it talks about this is a really nice job. You know that the best way to prevent the spread of coronavirus is to wash your hands. Wash your hands! Wash your hands! But why? It's because soap, regular soap, fancy honeysuckle soap, artisan peppermint soap, just any soap absolutely annihilates viruses like the coronavirus. Here's how. This is what a virus like coronavirus looks like. It's a bit of material surrounded by a coating of proteins and fat. Viruses easily stick to places like your hands, but when you rinse your hands with just water, it rushes right over the virus. That's because that layer of fat makes the virus behave kind of like a drop of oil. You can see it happening in this demonstration. Oils are just liquid fats. What happens when you pour oil into water? It floats. It doesn't mix. But add soap. And suddenly that fatty oil dissolves into the water. That's because inside, soap has two-sided molecules. One end of the molecule is attracted to water, the other end to fat. So when the soap molecules come in contact with water and fat, these dual attractions literally pull the fat apart, surrounding the oil particles and dispersing them through the water. Let's go back to our coronavirus molecule with that layer of fat holding everything together. When it interacts with soap, bam, that fat gets pulled out by the soap. Soap literally pulls apart and demolishes these viruses. And then the water rinses the harmless leftover shards of virus down the drain. But, and you know where I'm going with this, it takes time for this effect to happen. 20 seconds to be specific. To show why, we ordered this lotion that mimics viruses and their fatty layers. It glows under a UV light. If you just rinse your hands under regular water, nothing comes off. If you wash with soap for just 5 seconds or 10 seconds, your hands are still covered. The virus is still there, able to get you and others sick. But 20 full seconds? Now the soap is actually destroying the virus. Hand sanitizer works too because it's mostly alcohol. And alcohol works in a somewhat similar way to soap, breaking down that fatty layer. You need a high concentration of alcohol to make that work. The CDC recommends hand sanitizers with at least 60% alcohol. But even with 60% alcohol, the CDC recommends using soap if you can. If your hands are sweaty or dirty when you use the sanitizer, that can dilute it and diminish its effectiveness. As for soap, just any old soap works. You don't need soap marketed as antibacterial even. 
The FDA says skip it. There's no proof it's any more effective. Just be sure to wash your hands for 20 seconds. That's happy birthday twice. Happy birthday, dear, I guess me. Or the chorus to Lizzo's Truth Hurts. Streets in my face. Or Prince. Raspberry Beret. Or Eminem. Go, go, only go. Or even Dolly. Jolie, Jolie, Jolie. Just as long as it's 20 seconds. And you're using the ultimate virus annihilator, soap. And that was a nice review of what I was showing you. Uh, alcohol doesn't work as well because it's only a two carbon chain. So it doesn't have as long as a, of a hydrocarbon part. Um, but wash your hands for a long time, 20 seconds. And if you use our soap, then you won't have all that drying out of your hands. That happens with those evil commercial soaps. All right. So how do other countries compare? Well, I, um, the Netherlands actually uses the most soap per year, about 24 pounds per person. Uh, the United Kingdom, I am aware that's the United Kingdom, is about 20 pounds. And then Japan, <coughs> so <coughs> Europe uh, seems to be the most obsessed with their soap usage. And that might have to do with what happened with the plague when they stopped using soap. So maybe they learned their lesson. Uh, Japan comes in a third, and then that is Brazil. And the world average is about 6.6, .6 because these guys are pulling it up so high. Oh, what about the good old USA? We did not get to be number one here. We are actually below the world average. Fascinating, huh? Um, and Russia is about the same as us. This was interesting to me. Uh, the Soviet Union, so 30 years ago, most of you weren't alive, but uh, that was when it was a communist uh, part of the world. They used about two pounds per person. <coughs> uh, that is India. And in India, where the cow is sacred, um, there's very little soap because of the poverty. And so it's making sure soap is one of the best things. And this fascinated me because I made this slide several years ago. but in China, where all this started, it's like one of the lowest uses of soap, which is two ounces. So wash your hands. That's what's on the sign that every school is uh, completely empty right now. Um, this was also fascinating to me, and it was what we use soap for. So we use it for bathing, for dishes, for laundry, for taking a bath, for bathing the dog. We already had our bathing up there, or for washing the car. So this is from my kids class, we actually made soap in the fall. So what do you think is the biggest use? Go ahead, lock in your answer. And the winner is cleaning clothes, just like in the Middle Ages. That's Joey, learning how to clean clothes in Nepal. 92% of soap use worldwide is actually for laundry. I'm not sure if that's still true, but yeah. In the US, it's actually down, it's only about 85%. And we're a little bit more obsessed with toilet soap. And we're also very obsessed with keeping our car looking beautiful. Um, anyway, uh, wax is not soap. This is actually another category of lipid. And I had to squeeze it in somewhere. And this is the most logical place to squeeze it in. And you will see why as we go through this slide. So this is a lipid, because what did lipids have in common? They had mostly carbon. So see all this quickly carbons and just this little part here. This, even though it's oxygen, it's not enough to overcome how much is there. So, excuse me, soap was special because soap was ionic. And as soon as you make it into something with a charge, positive, negative, that makes it that area hydrophilic. So it has both parts. Wax, on the other hand, triglycerides are completely hydrophobic. All right. Um, so wax shows up in beeswax. And so you've all heard about beeswax. Um, and so the bees use it. The wax is the hydrophobic coating around their beehive to keep their honey safe 
inside. Um, so the honey won't mix with the water on the outside. It is also on the fur of cold water aquatic animals. And so if you ever go to place where the water is really cold, like Alaska, the otters are just always floating. You see it at the Oregon Zoo, but they're doing, they're always like preening themselves. They're always putting their fingers through their fur. And that's because they're fluffing it up because of the wax. Their fur is covered with wax. And what the wax does is the wax keeps them waterproof. So the perfect purpose of wax is it's waterproofing for our beehive, for the coating on both bird feathers are covered with a wax uh, and the fur of uh, a lot of aquatic animals. Uh, some leaves do have a waxy coating, but most leaves uh, actually have these little fine hairs. There's some leaves that have these little fine hairs and that's why the water can't penetrate there or makes that little bead of water. Uh, you and I actually have a cholesterol coating on our skin, uh, and so that's what our waterproofing is. But what happens when there's an oil spill is oil is hydrophobic. It is carbon hydrogen, and so is the wax. And so the oil dissolves all the wax that is coating our beautiful little otter, and our otter now can feel how cold the water is. So not only does it get wet, it becomes hydro um, thermic. Uh, and so its body temperature drops and it's also now coated in oil, which would not be a fun thing for anyone. Uh, and the way what they do to rescue them is they rescue the otters and they give them a bath with soap. And that's how they remove the oil because the soap has the hydrophobic and the hydrophilic and they can clean the otter and then they have to clean the water. And um, by the way, ears wax is not wax. Ears wax is a whole bunch of lipids that accumulate in your ears. And it is actually due to food allergies. So if you're eating crappy food, you're gonna get crappy stuff building up in your ears. And most of you probably don't know this, so, um, or you don't realize it. So when I went to see my uh, former acupuncture teacher, Dr. Lee, who's from China, amazing herbalist, and she asked me, I hadn't seen her in like 10 years, and she asked me, oh, do your ears itch? I'm like, my ears don't itch. Why are you asking me this, Dr. Lee? Oh my gosh, the whole next week, my ears itch so much because I just wasn't aware how much they itched. Um, and so it had to do, um, it does have to do sometimes with food sensitivities, especially sugar. Um, all right, so we're gonna now talk about cell membrane lipids. And I'm gonna do a video. And this is related to soap because they also have a hydrophilic and hydrophobic part. So enjoy. I think this is the last of the squid girl chemistry. Hi. Oh, it froze. I am back and it must still be April Fool's Day. All right, renew mm -hmm. phospholipids. So, a phospholipid is a lipid with a phosphate. So, a phosphate is a P with four oxygens. This is going to be very hydrophilic. There are two types of phospholipids. There is a phosphoglyceride or a phosphoglycerolipid. Phosphoglyceride just condenses it, so it's going to make up a phosphate plus glycerol. Now, if you remember, before we did a triglyceride, and glycerol could hold how many fatty acids? A cow remembers. The cow says three. It could hold three fatty acids. But now a phosphate is going to replace one of them. So it's going to be a phosphate on the glycerol, and now just two fatty acids. There is another choice, and I want to mention it, and I'm going to erase it, and we're going to just focus on this one. Uh, and that is a phosphosphingolipid. So what happens here is you have a phosphate plus sphingosin, and 
I will show you sphingosin in the slideshow. I don't remember how to draw it out. Uh, and one fatty acid. But the key is they're going to come out the same. They're both going to have the phosphate is going to be the hydrophilic head. My head shakes when I'm right. And then there's always going to be two hydrophobic tails. So a shorthand way of showing these is you draw the head, it's phosphate, and then you get two tails. So we're going to eventually make it into shorthand when we get over to the cell membranes. With the glycerophospholipid, what would happen is the glycerol would be right here, uh, and the phosphate would be here, would be our head. It does have a charge, we'll see that in a moment. Uh, and then the two tails would be the fatty acids. Uh, in sphingosin, one of the tails is a fatty acid. Sphingosin is a much larger molecule, and so one of the tails is also sphingosin. Um, all right, and so that's part of our cell membranes. So we're going to draw a glycerophospholipid because we're really good at drawing glycerol. Because we just did it on the previous uh, little clip. All right, three carbons is glycerol. And they each have an oxygen. And then you can draw your hydrogen. Some people will condense the hydrogens and write it like this. You can draw a little sticks like we did on the previous slide. This oxygen on this one is attached to a uh, fatty acid. You can make it saturated. And the second one is attached to a fatty acid. You can make it unsaturated. Usually that's what happens. One of them is saturated and the other one's unsaturated. Oh, let's do three double bonds. There we go. I should have done a practice with that. All right. The third position, and it's always one of the top or bottom, it doesn't matter to me, most people show it on the bottom, is now a phosphate. A phosphate is interesting. Phosphate has four oxygens around it. One of the oxygens is connected to our glycerol. One of them is double bonded. Yes, that does give phosphorus five bonds. It can do that. Uh, it is, because it's in the third period, it can break the octet rule. And then the other oxygens in our body are ionized. And that is why this is so hydrophilic. Usually one of the oxygens then has a carbon, another carbon, and then like a nitrogen group, and then the nitrogen is ionized. Um, so you might see other stuff there. You, you don't have to, well, whatever is there, you draw there because you're going to always have your notes. All right, this part is our hydrophilic head. You will also see it, and again, it's up to you. Um, some places you will see, and actually it's in my slideshow this way, that they show the phosphate on this side. So they're kind of showing the head, the hydrophilic piece on this side, and then we have the oxygen that goes to a carbon, that then goes to a nitrogen, and I can't remember the nitrogen might have other hydrogens or carbons on it. Um, but this is our hydrophilic, and then those are two squiggly tails, like our squig, squid, so squiggly. And where the phospholipids show up, whether it's glycerol or sphingosin, is in our cell membranes. We're going to draw a cell membrane because you are going to be drawing cell membranes um, for me in the show your work portion of quizzes and interns. So this is going to draw three squiggly. They always have two squiggles. This is different from soap. Soap has one squiggly tail. Phospholipids have two. Another thing that's going to be different. They make two layers. So our soap micelle, I should have erased it. But we had grease in the middle, and it was one layer. This is not like our cell membrane. This was a micelle. It's just one layer. 
And the, the reason for that is because the center is nonpolar. So when the center is nonpolar, all we need to do is make a boat. Things that are nonpolar can't get around in our body unless they're in a boat. What a cell membrane is, is we're making a barrier. So inside is water and outside is water. And we need to separate the inside from the outside. So like the walls in your room. If we didn't have walls, we'd all be like, oh no, oh no, everybody's around us. Um, and so it makes a lipid bilayer, is what it is called. It's called a bilayer because it's a double layer. So the barrier is our non-polar tails, which point towards each other. And then the outside is the hydrophilic part. So non-polar or hydrophobic. Um, non-polar is just easier to write. And then this is our hydrophilic heads, are on the inside and the outside. And these can be phosphates. Um, there's actually other choices, uh, or sugar, anything that's hydrophilic. This is my hydrophilic head. So we should draw them as hearts, huh? Because they love water. Let's do that. Because they love water. You can do it too. On my walk, I pass a house. Two houses have done this. So there must be something online about it. Uh, and they just filled their window with hearts. And then they also said, hey, we love everybody, we're all in this together, and we're all going to get through it together, and we're going to get through it because we love each other. All right, so the hearts are on the inside, and hearts are on the outside, because water is on the inside and outside, and it is a barrier to anything that is polar, anything that is hydrophilic which is most things in your body. And then things that are hydrophobic can actually get across it. So cell membrane, lipid bilayer, that is part one. Second part, uh, and again, this is the barrier. It's our fortress. Around every cell in our body, in everything, in the polar bear's body, you will also have protein. And proteins can have a couple of functions, but their overall function is they allow communication. So right now we're all inside of our wall, and how do we communicate? We're communicating this way. Um, but it could be a door, so it could be a channel, uh, it could be a receptor, it can also be a boat. And so sometimes it's a boat, so that's how glucose, glucose is very hydrophilic. Uh, and so on the outside, there'd be a little boat that is a protein, and when glucose binds to that boat, the boat carries it across and drops it in the cell, and then it goes back. And that boat is a protein. Um, so some of them, this shows that it goes across the whole membrane, and so it could be a channel, and when the channel opens, certain things can come through, or it could just be a receptor. And we're going to spend a whole week talking about hormones and neurotransmitters, uh, but in a receptor, the insulin would be our hormone, would just bind down here. And the insulin never actually goes in the cell, but what happens is the insulin kicks the cell into action. It sends all those little boats to the outside to pick up the glucose and to keep bringing them in, because um, that's what insulin itself never enter, enters the cell, but it says food is here and tells our cell to then get all the enzymes ready to do something with the food. All right, that's the second piece is the protein. And there is a third piece. And the third piece is what our lecture is week three, is cholesterol. And cholesterol is in every cell membrane of your body. Uh, so for right now, you can just show it as like a block thing here. So that's cholesterol. And it would probably be over here, too. And what most of the books say is cholesterol gives integrity. I call it the Goldilocks. It is Goldilocks. 
So and make sure that your membranes are not too fluid. It gives it some stiffness. Cholesterol is not fluid at all. This cell membrane is called the fluid mosaic model. And when we look at the pictures in the slideshow, we'll see it's a mosaic because these proteins are all over and, and you don't see until you look at the whole picture what all is going on. Um, it is a model. It's a pretty solid model, but um, let's talk about it. The fluidity. I'm going to emphasize this because last term this was a question that everybody missed on the midterm. The fluidity does not come from cholesterol. Cholesterol makes sure that it's not too fluid. But it is important to recognize this is fluid. It is not static. It's not like when you make a mosaic, uh, a student made me a mosaic that's in my backyard and it's beautiful, um, that everything stays where it is. Everything's actually moving around in this beautiful fluidity. And what gives it the fluidity are the kinks. And what were the kinks? They were the double bonds in the unsaturated fatty acids. This is the problem with trans fats. Trans fats. Your body thinks there's a double bond and it puts it wherever the double bonds were. One of the places is your cell membrane has lots of kinks. And suddenly you have trans fats in there. Trans fats don't have kinks. And it stiffens it up in a way it's not supposed to be stiff. And you lose fluidity. They also, kinks take up space. And so you now have space. You now have gaps. It's like a hole in the wall, and another hole, and a bigger hole. Suddenly you have this huge hole in the wall, and you can get really cold at night if you have holes in your wall. So eat real food. Mother Nature gives you such amazing food. Um, hopefully you've all emailed me what your healthy changes that you're doing, um, and go for it. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the lecture. Bye-bye. All right. So... Were yeah, um, I just realized my head shakes because that squid makes my head shake. Um, so phosphoglycerides; these are also called uh, glycerophospholipids. So it's just do you say the glycerol, which is this three-carbon piece first, or do you emphasize the phosphate first? This slide has a terrible typo. Um, and that is, this phosphate should have four oxygens around it. So there should be an oxygen here. Uh, and so this is the polar head or hydrophilic that loves water. And two nonpolar tails, the squigglies, the fatty acids, that's what's going to give us fluidity. So three carbons, um, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Very different from our triglyceride. The triglyceride had three fatty acids and so it was only nonpolar. There was no hydrophilic component. All right, so another picture showing you uh, this part here is our phosphate and it has charges so it makes it very uh, hydrophilic. This part here has that nitrogen. This is what I was trying to mention that there's usually different nitrogen groups on which makes it even more hydrophilic. Uh, and then the two tails, and often one is saturated and one is unsaturated. And again, this is where the trans makes this one lose its kink, and you get these gaps. Uh, a reminder, because some people are starting to ask me, uh, if you draw like this, you're going to lose something because this doesn't show the kink. So you do have to show your kinks to get full credit. All right. So lecithin is an example of a phospholipid. More specifically, it is a phosphoglyceride or a glycerophospholipid. And lecithin emulsifies. So back to that word emulsifies, which is what this whole lecture is about. Uh, it has to have a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic part. Lecithin is the food processor's favorite gem because it has the phospho part, which loves sugar, and the glyceride part with the two fatty acids, 
love all the fats that they add to everything. So chocolate, um, pretty much everything. If you start looking at anything you have processed, read the label and in there is less than and less than it's actually healthy for your body. A lot of people take it as a supplement. Uh, the word actually means, oh, and this is a picture of how it would work to emulsify. This is not a cell membrane because it's only one layer, but the hydrophobic tails are towards the middle and the hydrophilic heads are on the outside. Again, this is not a cell membrane because it's only one layer. Uh, and the word lecithin actually means yolk, meaning egg yolk. And that is where it's found, one of several places. Uh, what is an egg yolk is cholesterol. And we're gonna be talking about cholesterol uh, next, the next slideshow. It should be next week, unless you're behind and not watching this until next week, then you're watching a lot of me. Um, and it's also in your liver because that's where cholesterol is made in your body. So anywhere cholesterol is found in nature, you will also find lecithin because cholesterol is completely hydrophobic and it's gonna need some way to get around in this hydrophilic world of ours. Um, and so lecithin makes a boat and in the middle would be the cholesterol and it carries the cholesterol around. All right, our cell membranes, which we get to draw beautiful, the squigglies, you gotta make sure these are squigglies. So the interior, the middle is the nonpolar, and this is staying inside the cell is aqueous, and the outside is so the polar heads, which are going to be phosphates or sugars, and we get the lipid bilayer. So cell membranes are two layers. That's just another picture showing the kinks. It's really impossible to find a kinky picture online for cell membranes that show you all the space filling. These things are always moving around. They're very fluid. Like my squid hat is very fluid. All right, uh, I promised in that slide that I would show you a sphingolipid. Uh, so this bright blue is sphingosin. And so one of the tails, this is a long tail, this is a lot of carbon. So one of the nonpolar tails is actually sphingosin. And then this piece is a fatty acid. And then you have your phosphate head um, and so you're not going to have to draw sphingus in. You just need to know it's only found in cell membrane lipids, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, so the sphingus and backbone, these are mostly found in uh, CNS means central nervous system. So in our brain and our nerve cells. And the most famous one is this one. That is, is called sphingomyelin. So it's not the only example, but it is the most um, prevalent. So if you've had anatomy, you're familiar with this, and if you haven't, we're going to learn about it for a moment. So your the blue here are your neur neurons, so your nerve cells, and so if you kick your toe, you have to know right away that, ouch, that hurt, or if you put your fingers on a burner. Um, and so it is like a wire um, and electricity because the myth that the signal that is being sent is an electrical symbol signal. And so you always have a coating on the wire so you don't lose any of the signal. We'll talk about why I say that's a myth in a later slideshow. Um, but this allows the electro electrical signal to go much faster. All right. And I do know I keep hitting that little box at the top, but I can't get it to work without that. Even though there's a button, it didn't work. Right. It turns out 25, this is, you don't need to know these statistical numbers like that. 25% of our lipids, according to some book, said that they're actually sphingolipids, and it's something crazy like 80 or 90% of the lipids in our central nervous system are. So <clears throat> most of the sphingolipids are in our, our central nervous system, but you do find them in the cell membranes all throughout our body. Uh, the glycerol-based ones are much more prevalent in the rest of our body. All right, there is also, as promised, glyco, whenever we see this word, that means sugar. And this is one of the ones the elephant sat on. So uh, that is a hexagon. That was what it really looks like. Uh, there's lots of oxygen. This thing is very hydrophilic. So this is a sugar molecule, two fatty acid tails. My understanding is these are always a sphingus and backbone for the glycolipids. The polar part again is the sugar uh, and then one fatty acid. 
Uh, they, the reason I keep saying to the best of my knowledge is this build changes every week. Same with neurotransmitters. Uh, if they look for something, they will find them. So uh, they are, you will see these, so see there's the two tails and then they're trying to show the hexagon. So that's a glycolipid. Uh, and then these are the phospholipids and then the darker blue are the sphingolipids. So, um, and here we go again. So there are two types of glycolipids. So whenever you see these hexagon, oh, and this one I really like because they showed the little bright green. These are the cholesterol. Cholesterol, this is incorrect online everywhere. It is correct in your book. Uh, cholesterol does not give it fluidity. Cholesterol is very sticky, like we already see a picture of cholesterol. We'll see them next week. Um, cholesterol keeps a bit from being too fluid. Uh, so it keeps it just the right amount of fluidity. So the fluidity is coming from uh, all the kinks in the fatty acids and the cholesterol just makes sure it stays perfect amount. Every cell membrane in your body has cholesterol. Cholesterol is absolutely important for every cell membrane. All right, so this is just a picture to show you uh, if it, there's some homework questions where it just says draw a general picture. So you can do it like this. The green boxes you can show is the squigglies. Uh, so this down here is not a membrane lipid because there is no hydrophilic. We only have three fatty acids. And so that is fat in us and that stores energy. Uh, the membrane lipids have a hydrophilic part, which is either the phosphate or a carbohydrate. Um, so for the glycolipids, this carbohydrate could be one group, a monosaccharide, or it could be multiple. And I am thinking, I didn't talk about that in the slide, so I wanna mention it now. There's, there's several categories of these now. Um, the two that I know show up in your homework for the glycolipids, and I usually just call them glycolipid because my understanding is they are sphingosin, but it's possible they found other ones now. Uh, there are ones called cerebrosides, so C-E-R-E-B-R-O, and then S-I-D-E, side. Uh, cerebro means they found it in the brain, and those have monosaccharides. So it could be glucose, could be galactose, and then there are ones called gangliosides. So ganglio is G-A-N-G-L-I-O, and then side, S-I-D-E, and gangliosides uh, have oligosaccharides, which have like five or six. So if I go back, uh, these would be gangliosides because they have multiple sugar units attached to them. Uh, blood cell typing, so if you're type A or type B, you have different glycolipids here. I'm type O, mine is missing the glycolipid. And so that's why anybody can have mine because there's no little flag on it, my blood type. All right. Let's see. It's just another picture of cell membrane. I'm really into cell membranes. Uh, and also because I don't find any of the pictures adequate. But again, it's showing you it's, it's called the fluid mosaic model. These are all the proteins, these big red things. These are different carbohydrates, which can be flags. These again are oligo, which means a handful of hexagons. Uh, and again, sometimes it could be just one. And that, that would just give it the polar hydrophilic part. All right, these yellow squigglies are also protein communication. And the bilayer is anything that has the two tails. So the phospholipids and the glycolipids. Uh, this is really cool. The cytoskeleton filaments, they found out these are our antennas. So our body communicates faster than an electrical signal. It communicates actually before something has hap happened. So it's like your car, uh, you guys can turn your car on from inside the house now by pushing a little button on your key. And so they've been looking for these antennas. And uh, it turns out it's the, cyto, the cytoskeleton. They couldn't figure out what they were. They were calling them a skeleton because that's what they thought, but they actually think they're antennas that receive messages from other parts of your body faster than a chemical signal or an electrical signal. 
yeah, that's what this shows. So I love this picture. So it's all these pieces here and they didn't know what they were and now they're starting to realize. Um, a lot of this comes from this guy, Bruce Lipton, who is like possibly one of the happiest men alive. He's 70s or 80 now. Um, I'll talk about more when we get to DNA, but he calls this the magic membrane. He calls it the brain of your cell. It is the most underrated part of your cell. Without your cell membrane, you don't have a cell. Everybody looks at the DNA. He was like me. He was somebody who was very into DNA. His PhD is in biology. He was an electron microscope guru. Uh, and then one day he realized we were all running down the wrong rabbit hole looking at the DNA. We should be looking at the cell membranes. And he, this was actually in the 80s. Uh, and he started looking at the membrane different and he started writing things and he had just gotten his first Apple computer and he realized the words he wrote down to describe the membrane that he was looking at, he had seen these words recently and then he was looking at his instructions for his computer and it was a liquid crystalline structure is what he called it, which is what we call all of those computer chips. And if you start looking at a cell membrane a little bit different, it looks just like the computer chip in your computer or in your phone. Um, so we kind of create what's already in us for communication and stuff. Anyway, it doesn't matter if you believe me or not. These little yellow things, those are cholesterol. Every cell membrane has it. These greens, these are the glyco um, lipids that are little flags and the big blue guys are the proteins. All right. So trans fats. This is what we want. Gives us the kinks. The trans lose it. I already talked about this in the slideshow, but this shows you you lose the fluidity. You become sticky. That's what viscous means. It's stuck. So you're losing the fluidity. Things are not going to move around. Oh, what would happen if we did this in our computer? You wouldn't be able to send the signal, would you? Yeah, so we don't create trans stuff in our computer chips, but we've done it to our body. Um, and you also get gaps. That's what this picture doesn't show, but I showed it in a previous one, that you lose this, this, so it becomes sticky, so the proteins can't move around, which is really important. Uh, that this stays fluid, and you also get gaps in the membrane. So trans fats um, come out looking just like the saturated. You lose the kink, and a reminder again, when you draw these for the quiz, for the lab, for your midterm, you got to show the kinks. I don't expect you to have them drawn absolutely perfect, although the people I've seen so far have been drawing them beautifully. Use pencil. All right. So, this is that very first slide we saw and talked about lipids. Hopefully it looks less intimidating. Fats have, are completely hydrophobic. Wax was a waterproofing, um, like on otter's fur. Uh, steroids we're going to talk about in the next slideshow. And then these three down here have the polar and the two nonpolar tails. All right. And just a reminder. Please wash your hands. Wash your hands, you must these days. And you should also eat very healthy. Eat lots and lots of fruits and vegetables. And also sunshine. Uh, there's been a lot, came out like a month ago, and uh, there's some guy who just gave a big lecture somewhere. And so all our lectures are online, and it was about vitamin D and um, coronavirus. And uh, great, so that's it. And I'm going to stop.